Hi, my name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library at the National Historic Site here in Canton, Ohio. And this is our Fun with Clotus program. It's geared towards children and it happens every single month. You can watch us on Facebook or you can reach out to us via YouTube to participate. This month, we're taking a look at Eleanor Roosevelt, one of our country's most beloved and groundbreaking first ladies. There's a lot to cover with Eleanor. As you can see in this portrait, here she is talking, speaking, reading, uh, crocheting. She's got her glasses. She's in a lot of motion. And today, because we've got so much to share and talk about, we're going to look at a picture book and then we're going to talk about Eleanor's My Day and see if we can capture our own My Day experience. So the book we're going to read today is called Eleanor Makes Her Mark. It's how Eleanor Roosevelt reached out, spoke up, and changed the world. It's by Barbara Curley and it's illustrated by Edward Edwin Fortheringham. And at the beginning of the book, there's an amazing quote. It says, the purpose of life, after all, is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear. So that's something Eleanor said. Eleanor Roosevelt was feeling a little nervous. In a few weeks, her husband Franklin would be sworn in as president of the United States and she would become first lady. Soon she'd be living at the White House and she needed to get ready. You can see her checklist right there. Eleanor told the chief usher that the inauguration ceremonies must be simple. In fact, she wanted to serve hot dogs for lunch. She toured the White House from top to bottom, meeting with maids and ushers, cooks, butlers, doormen, and engineers. Eleanor was counting on the White House staff to keep things running smoothly, for as First Lady, she wanted more than merely being a hostess at official functions. All her life, she hoped to leave some mark upon the world. When she was young, Eleanor found her greatest joy in helping others. She and her father served Thanksgiving dinner to newsboys who lived on the street. With great aunt Gracie, she visited hospitalized children wearing casts and splints that looked very uncomfortable. And Uncle Valley took her to decorate a Christmas tree for families in one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City. Each experience allowed her to meet people who she realized suffered in one way or another. Eleanor felt their suffering deeply for she already knew sadness. Mother made her feel too shy and solemn. Father was more loving, but he drank heavily and was often out with friends, leaving Eleanor at home longing for his return. By the time she was 10, she had learned about loss. As well, mother, father, and her brother Elliot had all died. For the next several years, Eleanor and her brother Hall lived with their grandmother, who was kind but very strict. On Sundays, instead of playing games, Eleanor was expected to recite verses and hymns from memory. She could not lie in bed reading before breakfast, no matter how interesting the book she had hidden under her mattress. Eleanor was not even allowed to choose her clothes. She had to wear thick black stockings during long hot summers in the countryside. If she rolled them down to cool off, she was told that ladies did not show their legs and had to roll them back up again. Eleanor longed for adventure and desperately wanted to travel, but grandmother kept her close to home until she was almost 15. And here she is with her grandmother in her long black stockings. Finally, in 1899, grandmother decided Eleanor was grown up enough to attend Allenswood, an all girls school in London, England. There, Eleanor's real education began. Unlike many people at the time, the headmistress, Marie Souvestre, believed that women could form their own opinions. 
Her discussions of religion shocked Eleanor into thinking and her views on human rights inspired Eleanor's desire to work for social justice. And I love how all of the schoolgirls in the background are turning into paper dolls and Eleanor is running off with them. With Mademoiselle Souvestre's encouragement, Eleanor became a leader at the school, so well liked by all the students. On Saturdays, they filled her room with violets. Eleanor loved Allen's Wood, but when she turned 18, grandmother declared it unthinkable that she not return to New York to enter high society. For Eleanor, the departure was very hard to bear. Reluctantly, she packed her bags and headed home. By now, though, she had formed her own opinions about how to live her life. She obliged grandmother by going to fancy dances with all the other debutantes, but she also investigated the work working conditions of women in garment factories and taught calisthenics to girls in settlement homes. Most debutantes she knew would never step foot in the tenement neighborhoods of New York, but Eleanor wanted to help and to better understand the lives of people living there. Eleanor did like one thing about being a debutante. It allowed her to get to know Franklin Roosevelt, who was charming and funny. She liked that he admired her intelligence and independent spirit. Soon they were engaged. After they married and started a family, he became a state senator for New York. Eleanor began to make her own mark in politics by listening to voters' concerns and building connections in the community. Then in 1921, Franklin contracted polio, a disease that let him, left him unable to walk without leg braces and an arm to lean on. Eleanor helped him stay active in public life. And when he was elected governor of New York a few years later, she became his partner in the work. While Franklin toured the grounds of prisons, asylums, and hospitals, Eleanor went inside for real inspection. She checked to see if rooms were too crowded and if the staff was kind. She even peeked into the cooking pots to learn what was bubbling on the stove. When Franklin was elected president in 1932, he needed Eleanor more than ever. The country was in the midst of a tremendous crisis, the Great Depression. Millions of people were out of work. Banks and schools had closed. Families lost their homes and farmers lost their lands. How could the president best help? Who could he trust to reach out to the neediest Americans and give him an honest assessment? Why, Eleanor, of course. Government, Eleanor believed, should serve the good of the people. So she encouraged everyone to write to her and share their struggles, hopes, and fears. In the mornings, she did her calisthenics. She rode her horse, Dot, on the bridle path of Washington. Then Eleanor settled into her study. With the help of her assistant, Malvina Tommy Thompson, she tackled a mountain of work, sometimes receiving hundreds of letters a day. And if someone wrote a letter she thought especially important in the evening, Eleanor dropped it along with any memos she'd written and Franklin's basket for him to read. And there she is, reading all of those letters. Eleanor brought important people to the White House for Franklin to meet. Women working for equal rights, students working for a better future, and African Americans working to end discrimination. But Eleanor wanted to help more people, as many people as she could. To do that, she would need to learn about their lives. So she hid the road traveling to unexpected places that the press found astonishing for a first lady. She took the mine trains two miles underground to watch 400 miners dig coal. She rode in the workman's cage to the base of the Boulder Dam. She crisscrossed the country visiting housing projects reform schools and jails. 
Not everyone applauded Eleanor's civil rights work or efforts to help the poor. Even Franklin sometimes wished she could not push him quite so hard to do the right thing. And some people thought Eleanor should keep her opinions to herself. But that didn't stop Eleanor. She still gave lectures, held press conferences, made radio broadcasts, and wrote a six day a week newspaper column. And Tommy took dictation everywhere, in cars, on trains, and even when Eleanor was in the bathtub. Eleanor's work left its mark on the country, convincing many Americans that despite their own hardships during the Great Depression, they must look out for others as well. But in 1941, just as prospects were brightening, America faced a new crisis, World War II. While Franklin oversaw wartime strategy, Eleanor traveled to the South Pacific, visiting military hospitals from the Cook Islands to Guadalcanal. As she stopped by every bed, shaking hands with the wounded and offering comfort and thanks, she felt herself rebel at the horrible waste at war. She returned home more determined than ever to help build a peaceful world. By March of 1945, Eleanor worried about how ill and exhausted Franklin looked. She prayed he'd be able to carry on until there was peace. All she could do was make it as easy as possible for him. When he retreated to his polio center in Warm Spring, Georgia to rest, Eleanor remained behind to continue her work. She kept in touch with Franklin through phone calls and letters, delighted that he had gained a bit of weight. Much love to you, dear, she wrote. You sounded cheerful for the first time last night, and I hope you'll weigh 170 pounds when you return. For a few days, it seemed like Franklin might be getting stronger. Instead, on April 12th, he died. Eleanor quietly traveled to Georgia to bring his body home. And there she is in front of the train car with his casket as people looked on. Just before he was sworn in to replace Franklin as president, Vice President Harry S. Truman had asked Eleanor if there was anything he could do for her. But Eleanor, who understood the burden he was taking on, had replied, is there anything we can do for you? Truman soon found the perfect answer. That December, three months after the war ended, he appointed Eleanor to serve as a delegate to the first meeting of the United Nations General Assembly, an organization founded to foster peace. And so she was able to leave her mark on the world, leading the committee that created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a statement that championed the value and dignity of every human being and captured the spirit of an extraordinary first lady. Candid, compassionate, courageous Eleanor. So that's our story. And I'm gonna show you a few pictures of Eleanor at work. Here she is looking at a works progress administration site where they are building something and she is looking on and observing. Here she is at the United Nations. Here she is talking to a young girl. She was visiting lots of families and lots of people, getting their feedback, asking questions, and writing all of those ideas and notes to her husband, the president, but also sharing them in other ways too. Here is a singer that she um, loved and um, helped to get a performance by. Here she is sharing a dinner with a family. And here's a sample of her column, My Day. And that's a little bit what I want to tell you about. So while she was serving as first lady, 
Eleanor had her own news conferences. She gave lectures and she participated in radio broadcasts. One additional thing that Eleanor did was write a newspaper column. That column, My Day, was full of her daily thoughts on matters great and small, especially relating to women. It was hugely popular and brought comfort to people during trying times. People looked to Eleanor's column to hear her thoughts on important issues like working conditions for women and segregation and racial justice. Eleanor often wrote very po poetically about those issues, talking about her observations of the world and then incorporating those into her feelings about what she had observed. So I'm gonna read you a little entry so you can get a sample and then you can write your own My Day. And because spring is just starting, there's leaves growing back on the tree branches and the sun is shining here in Canton, Ohio. I'm gonna to read to you something she said about spring that was very interesting to me. It's from March 22nd, 1948, Sunday. As I was watching the birds eating the breadcrumbs on my dining room windowsill the other day, I looked down and there I saw the first green shoots poking their heads up through the ground. Somehow the first green you see in your garden in the spring never loses its thrill. We still have snow through the woods. And when I walked along a road that I thought was passable, I found myself sinking at least two feet at every step. But everywhere one feels that, everywhere one feels that spring is on the way. Even my little dogs have spring fever. They go dashing into the woods and stay out for hours, giving me much anxiety. Spring is the time for dreams and the renewed conviction that death in some mysterious way brings new life. I wish that with the coming of spring, we could think of all the young lives that were lost in the last war and devote ourselves more earnestly than ever before to seeing that out of those deaths, life comes to young people all over the world instead of more suffering and devastation. So I love that she was thinking about a big issue like the war and loss and that she framed it around spring. So what can you write about your day? What observations can you make about spring and what connections can you make to things going on in the wider world? Sometimes it just takes a few minutes to sketch out your observations about the world and how you'd like to see things. So my challenge to you is to think about something you did today. Maybe it's an observation you made looking out the window, or maybe it's something that you had for lunch or a conversation you had with a parent or relative or friend. And I want you to write down some observations about it. What did you see? What did you smell? What did you hear? Use your senses and write a short description and then think about the bigger issues in your world. How can you make connections to what is going on in your community and something that you wanna do and change you wanna make? So I think those ideas, those big ideas and those little observations, that was something Eleanor Roosevelt was all about. So that's my challenge for you for today's episode of Fun with Flotus. So if you made some observations or you wanna share something you wrote about your day, please reach out to us at the National First Ladies Library. So thank you so much for watching Fun with Flotus and we will see you next time.